Okay, this video that we just show is, even though it's very short, it captures very well the tension between Western media, China, and African countries. Um, as you can see, the CNN reporter here was trying very hard to politicizing um, Ken Kenya's choice of taking loans from China, while the Kenyan president tried to normalize it as a business move uh, by pointing out that Kenya has the same collaboration with other countries like France or Japan, um, but which, however, are not under the same accusation that CNN lays against China. The demonization of China in Western mainstream media is very common nowadays. Many attributes this to the fact that uh, let me move to the next slide. Uh, the fact that China is rising quickly to become a threat to the hegemony that the Western countries, especially the U.S., is maintaining over the world. American political scientist Graham Allison coined the term the Thucydides trap to describe the situation that when a great power's position as a hegemon is threatened by another emerging power, there is a significant likelihood that there's gonna be war between the two powers. Allison led a case study which found that among 16 historical instances of an emerging power rivaling a ruling power, 12 of them ended in war. The Thucydides trap captures the main characteristics of the context in China and this BRA has been operating in. First, China is deemed as a new rising power which will challenge the current world order in which US is the greatest power. Second, the intention of China to avoid conflict or even war is continuously shaping how China frames the BRI discursively. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the, the, the BRI now. The Belt and Road Initiative was once translated as One Belt, One Road Strategy, with the One Belt referring to the Silk Road Economic Belt and the One Road refers to the 21st century Maritime Silk Road. As you can see in the map on the slide, it was intended by the Chinese government to recreate a modern Silk Road based on the Asian one connecting China to Central Asia and Europe but it's way more than just roads as it aims to create and connect railroads, highways, air routes, and other means of transport across China, through Central Asia, the Middle East, and on through to the whole of Europe. The construction of BRI effectively proposes the creation of an economic common market across the countries integral to its route. So far, China has signed collaboration agreements with 140 countries, and it's the largest infrastructure investment project ever. Between 2013 and 2019, China has invested about $180 billion into it. And this is just a beginning. Probably all sorts of presentations of um, the road, road initiative in the past few years have shown you know, maps like this one, which highlights the roots of their project. But interestingly, however, now on the official website of the BRA, the old explanation of the BRI roads has been replaced by the emphasis that there should be no belt or no, or no road. The new emphasis is that any country and region, in addition to those located on the roads, routes of the building road, are welcome to join the uh, building road initiative. From one belt, one road to no belt, no road, the evolution of its name actually contains a lot of messages. Let's unpack it here. When the BRI first came out, it was claimed by many West media to be China's trillion dollar plan to dominate the world. Many look at the map and then turn to the theories of people like Alfred Mayhan, Nick, Nicholas Spickman or Halford McKinder, who in their own way argues that whoever controls the Euro-Asia, the so-called world island, and the important ports along the coastline controls the world, but you don't have to be a geographer or historian to see the geopolitics here. By connecting China, Central Asia, and Europe, and making Euro-Asia the most connected and pro pro prosperous land in the world, the other countries like UK, Australia, New Zealand, US, and Canada would naturally be on the periphery if they don't join the club. Um, China wants to tune down the spotlight on the route, firstly, because now you don't really have to be on the route to join the project. And secondly, it doesn't want to pose itself as a threat to the current world order. Another interesting alteration of the English translation of the name of the project is that it used to be the One Belt, One Road strategy. Now it's called initiative. 
At the beginning, it was intended mostly as a plan or strategy uh, for the development of the economy, economy of China and opening it further uh, to the outside world. Uh, but it is based on economic models proposed to, it, it, to utilize China's, uh, uh, China's excess uh, capacity of production and uh, its uh, extremely high foreign currency reserve and its great experiences and uh, um, uh, proficiency uh, and efficiency in the infra infrastructure construction. Um, and uh, this actually accomplished very well with the needs of Central or Western Asia and many African countries, um, what they need, because they can get no interest loans from China to build infrastructure with, with the workers from China. Once their infrastructure is in place and their economy uh, develops, they can pay back the money. It makes very good economic sense, but um, that the BRI should generate win-win outcomes for both China and those countries on the route. But when the BRI was stigmatized by the West as the debt traps for poor countries, as you can see in the video we just showed, the world strategy sounds too aggressive. Um, the BRI has actually three layers. First, it's a strategy of opening up. It is, a it is also a proposal for peaceful co coexistence of the countries in the world. And it is also a project of economic development. It has these three layers, but in the end, the layer as a proposal stands out um, and the word in initiative is selected to convey the message that joining BRR is voluntary and everybody's welcome. So China is proposing rather than forcing the collaboration onto, onto the other countries. Like the names of the BRI, the specific discourse of BI is also going through refinement and evolution all the time. Every time when a new policy of BI comes out, it intends to elaborate even more on what the BI is and what it does. Therefore, BI has also become a discursive system that constantly evolves itself. Yes, it is an economic project for infrastructure, trade and investment, but it has also become more of a project of giving the world the Chinese answer to the question, how do we coexist in peace and prosperity? China needs to be able to answer this, this question to avoid the, to see this trap and simply to survive. But once it gets the answer, at least theoretically, another question arises. How can China convince the rest of the world that its proposal could work to benefit the others as well? And education plays an important role in answering both of these questions. In this slide, I use a diagram to illustrate the core values and principles created within the Belt and Road Initiative and how education fits into the agenda. In answering the first question, how do we coexist in peace and prosperity, the BRI provide an antidote to the zero-sum mentality that has characterized the narratives which sees China as a threat, and does that by proposing a win-win logic that lies at the center of the whole BRI discourse, while the zero-sum logic sees one's gain as others' loss and therefore needs to competition and conflict. The win-win logic points to a highly collected world community where one's gain could also need to others' gain. To achieve the win-win scenario, the BRI continues to propose that to build communication and cooperation based on the rule of common prosperity and respect for diversity, all these eventually need to the building of a community with a shared future of mankind. With this logical line, the BRI discourse sketched out a vision of its own of the future world. On March the 17th, 2018, the vision of building a community with a shared future for mankind was incorporated into a United Nations Security Council resolution for the first time. This symbolized the moment when China proposed its own ontology of the world and it was recognized internationally. Why are all these terms and ideals are very abstract and even idealistic? The documents coming out later in 2015 and 2017 specify further how high education can help in bringing these abstract terms to tangible reality. In 2015, the Chinese government first laid out the rule 
that education could play in the Belt and Road Initiative with this release of the document, Vision and Actions on Jointly Building Silk Road Economic Belt and 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. In this document, the five major goals of the BRI was listed as policy coordination, facilitate collectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration, and people-to-people -people bonds. In this last goal, people-to-people -people bond, the document made repeated references to education, hailing the potential of academic exchange, BRI scholarships, CFCRS, research cooperation, entrepreneurship training, and skill development. Here, I would like to bring your attention back to the second of the two questions raised earlier in the presentation. How can China convince the rest of the world that its proposal could work to benefit the rest of the world as well? Well, the short answer is to win people's heart. It is worth noting that in the English version of the action plan, the term to build people to people ties is not a very literal translation of the Chinese terms. Uh, a more literal translation would be to connect the hearts of the people. While to build people to people ties emphasize on the means of achieving such connection through spontaneous activities initiated by long government entities. Uh, but, then to, but to collect the hearts of people actually emphasize more on um, the end or the goal of it, that is to influence the hearts, to win the hearts. The education is conceived as a base medium for it. The quote from uh, you know, a professor involved in this project explained well. He, he says that it is only through education and skills training that we can achieve deeper cultural understanding and carry out a long-term and meaningful strategy. The role of education in the Belt and Road Initiative was further clarified in 2017 when China's Ministry of Education published the Education Action Plan for the Belt and Road Initiative. This document provided an in-depth framework and top-down design of what kind of education projects could be carried out as part of the BRA. The document outlined three main visions for education partnerships to adhere to, namely, first, the promoting people to people at bonds, second, cultivating supporting talents, and third, achieving common development. Over the past several years, education projects have begun and been carried out around BRI countries in line with these guiding visions. Activity has primarily been concentrated in Southeast Asia, Southern Asia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe, with recent growth in Southern Europe, Northern Europe, and the Middle East and North Af Africa. These projects have Scratch sketched across a variety of sectors ranging from language and cultural education, student exchange, technical and vocational educational training, research partnerships, capacity building, international schools, and so on. Here, I won't go through all the points in the policy, but I would rather go back to the slide from yesterday and use three major types of Chinese transnational education to illustrate how on the ground level the practices are taking place. Yeah, this is a slide from, from my uh, last presentation yesterday. And uh, here, um, there is a deployment of different types of transnational education that has been mobilized by the Belt and Road Initiative in um, achieving its goals of collecting people. Uh, first, the Confucius Institutes. The Confucius Institutes is language learning and uh, cultural promotion. And it has been successful in, in, in terms of scale. And it's starting from 2004, and now it has been established in 162 countries. There are more than 500 Confucius Institutes in the world, and a lot of students and teachers are being involved. Um, and the second one is a Nuban workshop. It is mostly for vocational training and uh, to support the Chinese companies or factories operating abroad and training talents for them. And so far, there has already been seven of them in Asia, two in Europe, and uh, there are two in Africa. There are eight more will are, we are be established in, in Africa. And uh, the CFCIS is something I elaborated already yesterday. And so with, with these three, uh, you can already see each of this form have their own specific function uh, in um, how is it, promoting China and Chinese culture and uh, its connection with the countries on the Belt and Road, road, um, Belt and road initiatives. And uh, 
um, my personal experience, I mean, I can give you a, a more interesting uh, ex cases about CI, Confucius Institutes here in Denmark, because in Denmark, there used to be three Confucius Institutes. Now, uh, two of them have been closed down due to the, of course, there are other reasons that people use, but uh, ultimately it's because of the changing of the political atmosphere here. So CI has been stigmatized as the propaganda machine of the Communist Party of China and uh, the, the universities which used to host the Confucius Institutes here, they don't want to risk their reputation because if you host the Confucius Institutes, there is a risk that people will, will attack you for um, sacrificing your academic freedom to, in, in order to gain money or financial support from China. So as you can see from this case, even though uh, on, the, on the paper, it seems that China has been very successful in mobilizing higher education uh, for its agenda in the, in the Belt and Road Initiative. But in reality, these transnational educational institutions has came across all sorts of challenges and problems as well. And uh, yeah, that is approximately mm, the, the content for my whole presentation. And in the end, I would like to bring you uh, your attention to two questions that uh, we can probably think about during our group work. The first is, has education ever been left alone from the nation state's image building projects? And second, should a university take on the role of connecting people, even at the price of being tied up into the political agenda um, for example, in the Danish university's answer to this would be no, because they don't want to lose their prestige and autonomy and by involving in, in this sort of project. Even though for the university, it could be totally neutral, it has nothing to do with, with politics, but it will be politicized in a context like this. Thank you, that's my presentation.